Good morning, my friends. Good to see you all. Lord bless you. Please stand as we sing our call to worship the solid rock. That thing is loud. now. Good morning. It's the first day of spring. Welcome to Granite Hills Baptist Church. Uh, if you're a first time visitor, I want to welcome you. If you've been here before, I want to welcome you back. Um, we have a special speaker, Dr. Randy Galusa. He's going to speak about creation and on uh, Sunday night, we, we are doing a creation seminar in one of the discipleship training classes. And uh, we live in a universe, uh, uni, single, verse, sentence. We live in a, a single sentence. And that sentence is, and God said, let there be. Amen. What a wonderful thing it is to know that we have a creator who loves us so much. We have 8 o'clock service this morning. We have 9.30 Sunday school. I encourage you to come to that. I'm the Sunday school director. So if you have any questions about Sunday school, you can come to me. We have the 11 o'clock service. And then we have our 6 o'clock evening service after discipleship training at 5. Um, we have on Tuesday night, we have Celebrate Recovery. And we have a couple of leaders of that here, we have Abel Gonzalez and Megan. Hi, Megan. It's good to see you. And uh, Celebrate Recovery is a 12-step uh, recovery program, Christ-centered. So if you have any kind of hurt, habit, or hang-up, it's a great place to come on Tuesday night. Starts at 6.30. You're all welcome. Uh, Wednesday night is our hour of power right here at 7 o'clock. It's our prayer meeting. So... Please come to that, and uh, we also have uh, children's missions classes, which is a, a wonderful blessing for our kids to come to that. If you're a first-time visitor or if you want to make a decision, you can take your bulletin, fill out this part on the right side, and drop it in the offering plate, 
and we'll get to know you a little bit better that way. So now I would like to pray. Oh, we have the upcoming events. Please look those over and come to those if you want to. A lot of good stuff happening in our church. So now I'd like to pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for the leadership of this church, Lord. I pray for our senior pastor, Mark Morton, who is in Texas. Lord, give him travel mercies. And our associate pastor, Mike Schmidt, Lord, who is in Southeast Asia, Lord, bless him with safety there. Also for our missionaries, Lord, I pray for Bo and Stephanie White and uh, their family. I pray for uh, Dave and Ashley Lewis in McDermott, Nevada at the Quinn River Baptist Fellowship, Lord, and their six children. Please bless them there. I pray for Chuck Holton, who is our Christian missionary in uh, the Ukraine right now, Lord. He is our Christian news correspondent there. Please give him safety there also, Lord. I pray for the, um, Lord, I pray for the leadership of our country, Lord, that you would uh, guide them with your wisdom, help them to seek you and uh, your will in concerning this country, Lord. We need you more than anything, and I pray for that. Thank you for the Sunday school teachers here, Lord. Bless them as they're preparing to teach uh, all ages here about you, Lord, our Savior, and for your glory, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, note that he said six children. Dave told me his van will hold ten, so I don't know what that means, but <laughs> that's so great. I was so glad that new baby got born. That was cool. I was in Death Valley this last week, and it was 91 degrees there. It was like you come home and you're thinking, wait a minute, what happened? Uh, we had to, it's like, get the fire going, honey. We had to start a fire. Oh, my lands. It was so nice down there. But it's still Death Valley. I don't know. It's kind of an odd place. Let us continue our worship of our Lord in our song. And this is our operatory song as well. Turn your eyes.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for the ability to come to your house, Lord, and, and worship you, Lord. We just thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. We thank you for being an abundant God, Lord, who gives us all that we need. Lord, I pray that you would bless this offering, Lord, as, as we give back just a portion of what you give to us. I pray that you would use it to further your kingdom. And Lord, we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. We'll sing the power of the cross. Bye. 
Thank you. You may be seating. I love that song. Come on up, sister. All right. Good. So good morning. So I um, have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today. So I know you can look at his, his bio that's in there and you can read a little bit about him. Um, to me, he's been the dad to me for uh, 38 years. Um, he's been a faithful husband and father for almost 44, I believe, and um, he's just lived out um, ev everything he's preached, he's lived out, and he's modeled for us, and um, uh, he's always said that everything that you do um, is worth doing well and doing right, um, and uh, he's a, an example of um, a life that God has touched and God has called, and he's just been faithful in following the Lord in everything that he's done, whether it's been leading his family, um, serving our country, um, or uh, in ministry. So without further ado, that's my dad, Dr. Galuza. Well, that's the best intro I've ever had without a doubt and I've had a few over the years and so what a joy it is to see my sweet daughter and her children and her hubby her hubby's there he is right back there good to see all of you here today well we are we have a good reason to come to town and that is because of her and so we are here visiting and I have um, <clears throat> spoken quite a few times, and so I think I've at this church several times. So I thought, well, we're here in town. Why don't we just speak? And it worked out well because your pastor was gone. He's actually down to Dallas, where I just came from. I got a text from him this morning, uh, really early, and he said he had prayed for me, and he was praying for you and asked me to send all of you his love, that he was missing you and is anxious to get back but he is having a wonderful time with his family down in the Dallas area today. Well, as you can see up on the screen, we have a whiteboard. And so does everybody know what a whiteboard is? This is like Sunday school class. So this is one that you can actually take notes of because we're going to write on that whiteboard today. And I'm going to cover, as it says in the bulletin, three key questions. And these questions came up during a debate. I had this debate in a small town on the west coast, just north of Los Angeles, in El Segundo. There were two other people who I was debating, and it was moderated by an apologist. His dad was very well known when I was growing up. His name was Josh McDowell. Some of you may have heard of him. And his son is also an apologist, is Sean McDowell. And he posed the questions. So they were very good questions, and we were to address them. And they were such good questions, I thought... Everybody should have an answer to these questions, and they were related to creation and evolution. Question number one was, what is your take? Question number one was, how do you understand and interpret Genesis 1 and 2? How do you understand and interpret Genesis 1 and 2? Do you think you should have an answer to that? Sure. So that's a very good one. Second one is, in modern lingo, what is your take on Darwinian evolution, it's actually like a two-part question. So what's your take on Darwinian evolution and its compatibility with Christian faith? That's another one everybody should have a good answer to. What do you think about Darwinian evolution? Is it compatible with Christian faith? And then the third one was, are you open to nature pointing to design? In other words, when you look at creatures... Do they look designed to you? And would you say that when you look at creatures, they are the work of an intelligent designer? Would you believe that one of the persons I was debating who was from a Christian ministry said no. When they look at creatures, they do not see the work of intelligent design. So since I was in California, I wanted to be a little countercultural and see, look, I'm going to move. See, you see the screen up there? This is our whiteboard. I'm going to start with question number three first, <laughs> because let's, why not? We'll get to question number one. Are you open to the natural world pointing to design? And since I was from the Institute for Creation Research, I had an answer, and it was this. Yes, why, of course I am. 
to open to the natural world pointing to design. And I said the workmanship, the workmanship seen in living things is best explained by intelligent design. Now, why did I use the word workmanship? Because that is the biblical word that we should be using. That's the biblical word. You know Psalm 19.1, it says, The heavens declare what? The glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. His handiwork. So he's saying when you look out in the heavens, you should see handiwork. You should see evidences of workmanship. And in Romans chapter 1, it says, For the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Made, and that word, Greek word, we translated made there, is used only one other time in the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where it says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So really what Paul is saying is, invisible things of God, you can see about him by looking at the workmanship in creatures. So I'm going to argue that when you look at creatures, you're seeing the best workmanship that anybody could ever observe. Far better than anything that humans have made, and humans do some pretty cool stuff. But this exceeds them all. So I can't point to everything in terms of creatures, so I want to look at one area. How do creatures adapt? How do creatures adapt, and how do they even adapt to really, really tough environments? So you see those fish right there on the lower right-hand side of the screen. You see one of them is kind of pinkish looking, and it is missing its eyes. But it can mate with the other ones that are right there that do have eyes. Now, how in the world do those fish lose their eyes? Well, <clears throat> they find themselves trapped in a cave. And a cave is a pretty harsh environment. And these fish, as I'll show you just really quickly, they can rapidly adjust to the cave. They can detect when they're in the cave, and their offspring can be born without eyes and without pigmentation so that they can fit life in a cave. Now, does that look like that's designed? Yeah. You better believe that is designed. That is incredible design. And in fact, contrary to Darwinian evolution, which sees creatures adapting very, very slowly and very, very gradually over time and randomly through random genetic changes, and I know that's what all of you have been taught in school, when you read scientific papers today, Adaptation is characterized by those words on the screen, regulated. In fact, most scientific papers say it's highly regulated, not random. And it is not slow, it is usually very rapid. And it can happen over and over again. It's repeatable. Often it's reversible, and the solutions to the problems are so targeted to fit the problem that they're even predictable. Now, when you're reading those words, you're reading words of evidence of design. Evidence of design. Regulated, rapid, repeatable, predictable. That isn't a random process. And this is how it's being characterized in the literature. And so let's take on some of the icons of evolution, and one is these blind cavefish. In fact, it's not just one species of fish that can go blind. Over 120 different species can go blind in the cave. And not only do they go blind, they completely change their structure for life in a cave. And this, for all of the scientific -y types in the room here, these are all the scientific papers that I'm referring to. But on the right-hand side of the screen, you see all of those fish. You see a sighted fish at the top. You see a blind fish at the bottom. And those fish can go from sighted to blind in a single generation. One generation. Now, does that make sense? Of course it does. If you're going to design something to fit in caves, you want it to adjust rapidly. You don't have time to have it retrial and error over and over again. So this paper shows that these adaptations happen quite quickly. <clears throat> now you see these finches up on the screen, and some of you know they've been nicknamed Darwin's finches. And you've been told the story that their beaks can change very slowly over time when there's big hard seeds, the beaks, the birds with the big beaks, they kind of survive and reproduce. And the birds that have small beaks die, and then vice versa. When the seeds get small, they flip around. Hmm, what a silly 
story. What a silly story. In fact, researchers have now been able to study these birds. And in fact, the birds are divided into two populations. One population is still living out in the, in the rural area, eating traditional rural bird food. And others have migrated close to the city. And they're living off of human food because humans tend to throw their food on the ground, human trash food, and they're eating that. So you can study these birds, and what they found is the birds, as you see there up on the screen, can go from a big beak to a small beak in as little as two generations. As little as two, and in fact, the genes of these birds aren't even changing. The little quote from the scientific paper is on the bottom right. It says, growing evidence suggests that epigenetic mechanisms, those are mechanisms which are not even changing your genes. There are little markers placed on your DNA that change the expression of those genes. Epigenetic mechanisms <clears throat> may also be involved in what? Rapid adaptation to new environments. So these, the genes of these birds aren't even changing. There are mechanisms inside them which allow them to rapidly change. How about this icon of evolution? You've all seen it in your textbooks. It's the peppered moth. And you were told the story that there were all of these white moths over in England. And then when they started burning a lot of coal, it got everything black from all the coal soot. The white ones stood out. The birds ate them. And then the black ones, through natural selection, took over on all of those kinds of things. Another made-up, silly story that has been told ad nauseum. Millions of times. And it was wrong. Here's an interesting paper, came out in 2016. Industrial melanism in the peppered moth is due to a transposable element. You're going to learn more about science here than you probably learned in all of ninth grade. What in the world is a transposable element? Well, believe it or not, your DNA is not static. It's dynamic. In fact, your DNA is being changed in cells right now. And there are sections of DNA on your chromosomes. Does everybody remember these words? From like ninth grade, your chromosomes. Sections of DNA can be cut out. Tiny little molecular machines can come by and they can cut out a piece of DNA and they can move it and splice it in at a different location. And when they splice it in at a different place, it changes the expression of your genes. And in this particular case, as it says up there, over 95% of the black moths had a 20,000 piece long of DNA moved right to the promoter that turns them black. And 0% of the white moths had it. Does that sound like a random process or a highly regulated process? So none of these things are these random genetic changes that you all have been heard about in school. None of those things are really based on science, though they're being repeated right now at the University of Nevada at Reno and definitely Las Vegas. That was a joke. All right, so you're like, it's like, yeah, yeah, everything's worse than Las Vegas on all of those kinds of things. Just checking out the crowd here to see... You know whether you're literalists or whether you can go with the flow on all of that. Well, these are three major icons of evolution. Let's, let's go to a couple other examples of how these creatures can rapidly change. You're up here now in Minnesota. These people love to ice fish up there. They love to catch that big fish that that guy's holding in his hand. It's called a pike. It's a big pike, and a pike is a big predator fish. It will eat bass, it'll eat trout, and it'll eat these carp that are in the lake. And as long as it's eating a bass or a trout, the carp don't mind. But when it eats one of its fellow carp, and it digests it, and it puts little carpy digested vapors into the water, the other carp can detect that, and within a day, they can go from this shape to this shape. They can start to morph their shape, making them faster and harder for the pike to eat. Wow. That's quite remarkable. Does that sound like a random process or a programmed process? It is a programmed process. 
And this is how creatures can rapidly adapt. Here's another fish. This one isn't up in Minnesota. It's down in the Caribbean. It's called a reef race, a reef race. And they live down there, and the male is that brightly colored blue fish right there. The female is the yellow. And in a <clears throat> group down there on the reef, there's usually like one male who takes care of 12 to 15 females on all of that. Well, what happens if that male dies or some fisherman comes along and, and fishes the male out of the pack? What are those lonely females to do now? Hmm? Well, believe it or not, the females, usually the largest female, can detect that she's the largest female and can detect that the male is gone, and within a day, her ovaries regress, they change into testes, and she morphs into a male. Wow, quite remarkable. What females have been wanting to do for a long time. I mean, that's just like, okay, that was a joke, and you got it, good, good. You're hanging in there on all of that. There's usually one gal in the crowd who's shaking her head, no, no, on all of that. I mean, what a chance to get all of the privileges that go along with that. Wow, those are incredible changes. Here's another one. Read that headline. Mice can warn sons, grandsons of dangers via sperm on that. How in the world does that happen? Well, these are these biologists, and this is what they did. They took these male mice Male mice, they put them on a metal pad that could shock their feet painfully, but not lethally, painfully. And then they would expose them to cherry blossom odor and shock their feet. Expose them, shock them, expose them, shock them. Shock, shock, shock. Now you know what they do at, at Reno over here on that. And that's your tax dollars at work. Then they took these male mice, they mated them with females, that were never exposed to cherry blossom odor and never had their feet shocked. And then she had pups, and they sacrificed the pups immediately upon birth. Wow, that's torture too. Then they stained the pups through their nasal region looking for olfactory bulbs and nerves, and they stained blue. And this is what you see. On the left-hand side, stains through the nasal region, are the controls. These are little olfactory bulbs and these are the nerves right there and on the right hand side of the screen are the olfactory bulbs and the nerves of the offsprings whose dad's feet were shocked you see an over 200 percent increase in olfactory bulbs <clears throat> and guess what they're specific for cherry blossom odor and the offspring and the mom was are never exposed to it those are some of these epigenetic change which are passed on to the offspring in the sperm. Incredible. Well, how is all this happening? It's happening in the exact same way using the exact same elements as your cruise control. Your cruise control allows your car to adapt, doesn't it? It allows your car to adapt its speed to up and down hills. Well, there are three vital elements on your cruise control. There is a sensor. It's probably a sensor for what? Speed. There is a computer that says, if you begin to slow, then push on the throttle, and there is an output device, the throttle. You have what? Sensors, logic, and output. Please repeat those. Sensors, logic, and output. The logic is if, then, Logic, if then logic. Well, guess what? Creatures have those exact same elements and they're being used in the exact same way. You have sensors for all different kinds of things. You have built in logic that says if this changes, then produce this trait. And you have output responses. And it happens in the exact same way. So, what are those three elements that anything that is going to adapt needs to have? They have to have what? sensors, then logic, and then output. That's how adaptation happens, not random change. Not random change. It is a highly regulated process, highly regulated process. And not only that, the solutions precede the challenges. That's what you need. 
If you're going to go on a space shuttle, you don't want the engineers doing trial and error trying to work out the bugs with every launch. Do you? No, you don't. You want them to think through the challenges and build the solutions in in advance. And the Lord did that with the creatures so that they could be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. So here is a brand new way, which I know is brand new because nobody's talking about this, for a way for you to see adaptation. So now, for the rest of your life, I do not want you to see creatures the same way you were taught by evolutionists when you went to school. I do not want you to see creatures as passive modeling clay being shaped by their environment. Rather, you need to see creatures as very active, problem-solving entities that can detect their challenges, solve their problems, and be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Isn't that a much better way to see the creatures? That brings glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, their creator. They are what? Active, problem-solving entities that detect their challenges, solve their challenges, and are what? Fruitful, multiply, and fill the changing earth. Fill the changing earth. So, having answered why I see the design in nature, I'm in a much better chance and much better place to answer question number two. What is your take on Darwinian evolution? That's 2A and 2B. It's compatibility with Christian faith. Well, here's a, here's a good answer to that question. I know it's good because it's mine on that. <clears throat> Darwinian evolution is a weak scientific theory, and it is a poor explanation for the design we see in living things. And then second, the basic premise is the basic premises of evolutionary theory cannot be reconciled with, and I added a word, biblical Christian faith. Biblical Christian faith. So, why is evolution a weak scientific theory? Well, one, <clears throat> if evolution is true, you have to be able to get life going, and there is not a scientific paper published anywhere on the planet by any research institute, and I'm saying the best in the world, Harvard, Cambridge, Oxford, any of them, which documents a natural origin of life. They're not even close. Not even close, and that's what this paper says right here. The scientists don't have a clue of how life began, and that man who's pouring his little chemicals in this pond right there is just basically toying around more of your tax dollars being wasted in that. Second, if evolution is true, not only do you have to get life going without the help of God, but you have to be able to change it from one type of creature to a fundamentally different kind of creature. Don't you? You have to. And as far as we know, from every single human observation that has ever been made, without a single exception, now that's pretty good science, I think, Every observation, creatures faithfully reproduce after their kind. Zero exceptions. Zero. So where's the powerful scientific evidence? Why are they teaching it for a fact at UNR? You can't get life going, and nobody has ever, ever seen one creature change after another. In fact, creatures always reproduce after their kind different varieties, but no exceptions. There are limits to biological change. In addition, many of the predictions that evolutionists have made have been totally wrong, flat out wrong. Evolutionists appear, believe that life gradually changes over time, starting with a simple life form and branching off into more complex life forms, bringing about the diversity of Earth bringing about all the different body plans of all the different types of creatures, vertebrates, invertebrates, and all of those different types. But is that what we find when we look at the fossil record? No. We find essentially all the basic body plans showing up at once. At once. There's no gradual change over any time. So they were totally wrong on that. They were wrong on the fact that they said similar features between creatures 
are due to their common ancestor. And yet we find creatures like you see that, you see a mammal up there, that dolphin. It has similar features to a fish that's a shark. The common ancestor is way, way, way back. But they have similar features. We have a very similar eye to a squid. And supposedly our common ancestor would be way, 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 way back. And look at bats use echolocation. Dolphins and, and whales use echolocation. When you sequence their DNA, they have the exact same genes for echolocation. Where's their common ancestor? Way, 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 way back. So they were completely wrong about similar features being due to common ancestry. They were wrong on all different kinds of evidences that they've been giving you and your children over the years. They were wrong about your appendix being a worthless vestigial organ when we now know it as part of your immune system. They were wrong about that bone that you're sitting on that they have mislabeled a tailbone when it never has anything to do with a tail. In fact, it's a very important bone anchoring muscles in your pelvic floor that I'm glad is working for you right now. And you are too. They were wrong about gill slits. When they see little baby embryos developing, they see these little folds on their neck and they said, oh, they look like gill slits. This is going back to their fish ancestry. When those folds on the baby's neck never, ever have any gill tissue with them, never look like gills, they, they develop into things into your neck like your thyroid gland lower part of your jaw and other things like that. Totally wrong on all of these things. They found DNA that they didn't know what the function was and they said it's junk. It's left over from your evolutionary past. It's just been evolving away. It's worthless. And now studies indicate that the vast majority of this DNA has a function. In fact, it's got as important a function as the DNA that codes for your proteins because it regulates what those proteins are going to be and what their shapes are going to be. They were totally wrong on that. They were wrong on humans and chimps, I know you have heard this, being 98% genetically similar. Totally wrong on that. In fact, now, the best studies, I could even update my slide, puts our similarity at 84%. Totally wrong on all of these things, and yet they're still teaching it as if it's fact. So why is it a weak scientific theory? Because it's wrong, wrong, wrong over and over again. And not only that, they were wrong about this. On the left-hand side of the screen is the picture of, of Neanderthal man that I had when I was growing up, some ape-like transitional form between creatures and ape-like creatures and us. And now we know that Neanderthals were just another type of human, and we mated with them. Just be careful when you did all of that. <clears throat> totally wrong on all of that. Not only that, it's weak because it relies on a ton of imagination. Everybody have heard of the fossil Lucy? Look on the right-hand side of the screen there. That's an artist's rendition of Lucy. That's what they think Lucy looked like. I mean, give me a break. You put a little lipstick on her, and she would look like a Texan. I'm serious. I mean, really, really there on that. But on the left-hand side of the screen are the bones. Do you see a little bit of imagination between the bones and the artist's rendition? A load of imagination. Well, that was in the 70s. Nobody would do it today. Well, another fossil came out, Homo naledi. 2015, there's the artist's rendition on the left, and there's the bones on the right. You know, your poor kids are getting brainwashed. They see these pictures, they look like these transitional forms, and yet it's just pure, raw imagination. That's why it's a weak scientific theory. It's been wrong on so many things, and it relies on imagination. Well, what about this second part? It's compatibility with Christian faith. Well, I'm going to argue it's incompatible with the major basic premises. On the screen there are two, base, two famous evolutionists when I was growing up, Lewis and Mary Leakey. They were atheists, and yet they wrote a book called Adam's Ancestor, which has been the basis for theistic evolutionists and atheistic evolutionists since the 1960s when it was published. And they basically argue some fundamental things about how we evolve from some ape-like ancestor. 
but they are in direct contradiction to what the Bible says. For instance, the Bible says that man was a direct creation by God. God formed him from the dust of the ground. Evolutionists say, no, he descended from an ape-like ancestor. The Bible says that Adam was the very first human being and that Eve was made from his side. These evolutionists say, we don't know who the first human being was because you evolved from say, some ape-like ancestor. Which one of them would have been the first human being? In addition to that, the Bible says that all humans on this planet <clears throat> have descended from one pair of people, one couple, Adam and Eve. Every one of us have descended from Adam and Eve. And they say, no, it had to be a population. There was no way two people could populate the earth. It had to be at least a population of hominins of 10 to 100,000. So they were completely contradictory to the Bible on these major points. In addition to that, the Bible says in those verses that you see up on the screen from Genesis 3 all the way through 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible says that there was a real man. This is theologically. There was a real man who really did sin, he brought real death to every one of us because we were all in Adam. And every one of us needs a real Savior. Real man, real sin, real death, real salvation. All of these verses point right back to a real man whose name was Adam, who sinned and brought the fall upon us. That's a very important theological point. Very important theological point. Obviously, this evolutionary story is contrary to it all. But what about this? Let's attack this other icon called natural selection. Some of you have made your peace with natural selection. Ah, survival of the fittest. It's the law of life on land. Everybody sees survival of the fittest. It changes things. Well, think about what Darwin was saying. Darwin was saying that the diversity of life on earth came about through a death driven struggle and that's why Steve Jobs when he is dying of pancreatic cancer speaking at a commencement address at Stanford University utters these words he says death is very likely the single best invention of life it's life's change agent in Darwin's worldview, no death, no change, no improvement of life, no diversity of life on earth. It is a death-driven worldview, and it always will be a death-driven worldview. Well, Christians, we should find that repugnant. The Bible says death is not a gift, death is a curse. And the Bible says death is an enemy, and as we just sang in our one of our hymns today, death destroyed death. And death will be, will be gone someday. And what you see up on the screen there, on the left-hand side, should not look natural to you. You should not be hungering to see some animal predate on another animal. You should not find some, anything interesting in it like the lost do to see sharks eat something, lions take something down, or all over again, because that is not normal. And that is going to be destroyed someday. It will be gone. Hmm, now I'm stepping on toes. Because many of you have made peace with all of this. But this is incompatible with Christian faith. Here's another thing that's incompatible with Christian faith. Evolutionists say when creatures look designed, well, they, they may look like they were, but they really weren't because there wasn't a designer. So how many of you can see up on the screen some gears? You see a couple big gears, gears working together right there? Well, those are microscopic gears. You can't even see them with the naked eye. You have to look under a microscope to see them. And they're connecting the back legs of this little creature right here called a plant hopper. And it can go from 0 to 700 Gs in a tiny fraction of a second. And when it launches, it wants its legs to extend at the same time, at the same rate. Otherwise, it might launch itself who knows where. Well, how does it get its legs to extend the same way? They're connected at the back by a pair of what? Gears. 
gears. Gears join the legs. Now, when I see gears, it's perfectly reasonable and rational, rational for me to say there was a gear maker. There was a gear maker. In all of our experience, when we see gears, there was always what? An engineer and a gear maker. It is not compatible with Christian faith to say, oh, these evolved hit and miss, trial and error over a long period of time by random genetic mistakes. That's why it's not compatible with Christian faith. There's a lot of reasons why we shouldn't be making our peace with evolution. And that brings us finally to the last question. How in the world do you interpret and understand Genesis 1 and 2? They want to lead off with that. But you know what? The problem is most of the people struggle with their interpretation of Genesis 1 and 2 because they think there are scientific reasons why they should have some compromised interpretation of Genesis 1 and 2. So there was a reason why I started with questions 3 and 2 first to wipe out all of these scientific objections to why we should understand Genesis 1 and 2 normally. So here's an answer to that question. Genesis 1 and 2 are historical narratives. They're not fanciful stories. They're not allegories. They're real historical accounts of what took place. And how do I interpret it? Well, I give words their normal meaning in their normal context. Some people say literal interpretation. That's fine, but I prefer to say the normal meaning. Normal words, giving their normal meaning in their normal context. This is what I was taught at Moody Bible Institute when I was there. We give words their normal meaning. So as I read through Genesis 1 and 2, I treat it just like any other type of literature. As I go through this book, I give their words their normal meaning in their normal context. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm a physician, and I write prescriptions. Because when people come to the doctor, <clears throat> they like to walk out with something in their hand besides a bill on that. And so we give them a prescription. How many of you can read this on the screen? How many of you have highly evolved peepers right here and can read this medication? A tenolol, 150 milligrams by mouth daily. Can you see that? Does that make sense? What's the name of the med? A tenolol, how much? 150 milligrams. How do I want you to take it? By mouth, daily. Hmm, simple. So you take the script to the pharmacist, and the pharmacist reads it, says, what, what does Dr. Galuza mean by mouth? By mouth. You know, mouth of a river, mouth of a cave. So he changes your script to say, a tenolol, 150 milligrams, by a natural opening, daily. Oh, wow. Completely changes the meaning. But everybody understands what I mean by mouth. I mean what? This. This. Even though mouth can be a natural opening. But everybody means that. Normal meaning in the normal context. When Bonnie was a very little girl, I got sent to, because I was in the Navy at that time, Guam. And I was an engineer, and I was in charge of, of a big barracks rehab project. And the contract called for one modification. The rooms were to be painted. And the contract said, contractor shall apply two coats of paint. Pretty simple, pretty easy to understand. Well, the contractor came out, put on one coat of paint on all of the rooms in the barracks, took his gear away, demobilized, and left. Our inspector came out and said, you owe us a second coat of paint. And the contractor said, and we said, because the contract says you'll apply two coats of paint. The contractor sent us a letter that said this. What the contract means is one coat thick enough to equal two coats of paint. Ah, and he had put on a thick coat of paint. So in essence, according to him, we got both of our coats. The government sent back a letter and said, no, when the contract says two coats of paint, it means what? Two coats of paint. And this went to court. We had a dispute. 
So how many of you think the government won this? Or how many of you think that sneaky little contractor won and took the government for our money again? Well, the government won. The government won this one, and the judge said this. Oh, this is good. In contract law, words must be construed to their what? Normal meaning in the context of the specifications. Otherwise, the intentions of either party becomes unknowable. It means if you can make the words say anything you want them to say, then why write, even write them down? May I suggest when we interpret this book right here, we give the words their normal meaning in their context. Otherwise, the intentions of the Bible giver becomes what? Unknowable. Unknowable. So that's why I interpret it the way I do. In addition to that, there's good scientific reasons to see Genesis 1 and 2 as historical narratives. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but Hebrew scholars can look at Hebrew poetry and they can look at the con construction of some of the words and they can be plotted out. They can be plotted out graphically on different types of verbs and things. And they can look at historical passages and they can be plotted out because they're different and they're used differently. And Genesis chapters 1 and 2 plot right out with historical narrative passages. A very objective way of looking at these things. But this is a really important reason why I give words their normal meaning. It was a, a very, very important Reformation issue. All of those leaders that you see on the screen from Martin Luther to Calvin, they were important reformers. And we owe a lot to them. And at the time of the Reformation, there was a prevailing view among the church that said this. You, the average person in the pew, could not understand this Bible for yourself. They said it was a mystical book, and you couldn't understand it. It took a holy man, a priest, who could read the book and tell you what it says. Tell you what it says. Therefore, the book is not your authority. Who becomes your authority? The, the priest. And the reformer said, no way. God says what he means. He means what he says. If you give everybody this Bible in their language with a good translation, they can read it and understand it for themselves. This was a major Reformation issue called biblical clarity. Biblical clarity. And they pointed to many verses here, this book, this one in Genesis in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 30, right after Moses gave the law, it says, you don't need to go across the ocean and get someone to come and tell you what the book says. You don't need to go anywhere. It says the understanding of the book is near you. It's even in your mouth. And then as you see up on the screen, there's other passages from John and 1 John. The Lord Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will lead what? You into all truth. Lead you into all truth. And then over on the left-hand side is the book of Acts, chapter 17. And this is a very important one because it says the Bereans were not like the Thessalonians because the Bereans searched the scriptures. Wait a second. You, you're like the Bereans. You can search the scriptures. You can check out to see what, whether what I'm saying is true or not. It will be, because it's me. But anyway, it will be, but they're checking out Paul. Now, wait a second here. Common people? Common people can read the Bible and check out the Apostle Paul? Check out the Apostle Paul? That means if I give you the Bible, you can check out the priest. Hmm, that's why it's a really important Reformation issue. And that's why we would say today, no, we give you this Bible. You do not need to have a holy man come and tell you what it says. And when it comes to creation and evolution, we can say, you don't need to have a holy man and you don't need to have a science guy. You can read it for what it says. And we definitely don't want science guys who are atheists to come and tell you what this means. Do you realize your Christian forefathers gave their life for these truths? 
And yet you have Christians today willing to say, oh, let's let Stephen Hawking tell us how to understand the Bible and all of these things. This was a very important issue. We would say, no, you, tr you write this book, you translate it, you can give it to the Alka Indians, and they've never even heard of Stephen Hawking, and they can open it and understand it for themselves. That's really important. That's very important. And that's where I was differing from the other people who were on the stage with me, as I believe you can read this book for yourself. Well, one of them pushed back and said, well, you're making Christians look really dumb. You're hurting the gospel. I mean, everybody knows evolution's true, and when you say it isn't, you're making us look dumb. And, and it's, it's bad for the church. Well, here's a, here, this is a totally secular study, what you see on the screen, done by a professor at the University of Indiana and one from Harvard University. And they mapped out over time, from 1990 to 2015, the view of various churches, whether they thought it was inspired but not literal, that means you can make words say whatever you want them to say. Churches who believed it was the literal word of God and some churches who taught it was a book of fables. And they looked at church attendance over time and this is quite remarkable. Churches, which we would call liberal churches from that period, were hemorrhaging membership. And churches like Granite Hill Bible Church were maintaining membership or gaining membership. So the whole statement that you're making us look dumb, you're hurting the church, you're hurting the gospel, is wrong. It's churches like Granite Hills which are protecting the gospel. It's churches like Granite Hills which give a message which is fundamentally different from what the world gives as a message. Because when someone comes from out there and they walk through these doors, they don't want to hear the same thing that the world is saying. They want to hear something different. So you are not hurting the gospel. You're actually, you're actually sparing it. Because these people that are hemorrhaging from this church here, they're going to churches with no affiliation and believe that the Bible's a book of fables. Hmm. That's really important. And then finally, this is an important reason right here. Why do I give words their normal meaning in their normal context? Because the, the Lord Jesus did, the Apostle Paul did. When someone asked him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? The Lord said, have you not read? Have you not read? And then he said this, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female, quoting from Genesis chapter 1. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh, quoting from Genesis 2. He put them right together. He believed there was a real Adam and a real Eve. And then when Paul was speaking about the resurrection, he says, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. There was a real Adam. Do you know what that's saying? There's really only two groups of people on this planet. Two groups of people doesn't mean it has nothing to do with how much money you have. It's not rich and poor, what color skin it is. It's not black and white. It's not even Ukrainian or Russian. There's only two groups of people on this planet. Those people who are dead and lost in their trespasses and sins, and they are still in Adam. And there's a second group of people who have been born again, born anew, regenerated from above, their sins are forgiven, and they have been washed clean, and they are in Christ. In Christ. You're either dead and lost in Adam, or you're saved with new hope and new life in Christ. In Christ. That's all there is. So the question to you today is this. Where do you stand? You've been given three good answers to three important questions. They all support the Bible, which supports the gospel, which says that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you in Christ today? 
I'm going to close today, and I, I know they're going to have a, a song of invitation, so I'll turn it back over to you, Pastor. Thank you very much. Brother, that was so good. I always love that. The last time uh, Brother Randy was here, he was telling us how impossible it is for a baby to get born, but somehow God makes it. It's just amazing. I, I will I'll never forget that. So today, uh, if you have some decision you would like to make or uh, tell in front of the church, come on forward and we'll uh, let us know what, what it is. We're going to sing a song. Uh, We'll just go part of it there, all right? And uh, so if you have something that you would like to come forward and tell the church, come on forward. We'll have a word of prayer here and uh, ask God's leading. Father, we do thank you for this day. I appreciate the, the teachings of our dear brother here, Lord, and uh, thank you for that. We always enjoy truth. It does set us free, and thank you for that. So, Lord... As we think about decisions we need to make, even about how we would like to somehow think there's something about Darwinism, but Father, there really is not. So I appreciate the clearness of that message and uh, having experienced some of this, and uh, and just pray your watch care over our invitation time and anything that uh, you want to be accomplished here. So be it. Praise you, thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. In the midst of uncertainty, our faith can struggle. Our walk becomes labored, our heart heavy. There's something about the unknown which seems to weaken us. It drains our patience and blurs our focus. 
Yet, in the middle of everything, stands a faithful God. A God who's not swayed by the struggle, who isn't moved by the winds of chaos. A God who remains faithful, even when our faith is fragile. It seems more difficult than ever to not worry about tomorrow. Yet that's exactly what God has asked us to do. For when we cast our burdens on Him, the troubles of the moment begin to fade. When we trust the plans He has for us, our fear begins to subside. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, our focus becomes consumed by clarity. Yes, we are in the midst of uncertainty, but we can be certain of one thing. God is faithful, and that is more than enough for tomorrow.